Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Al Miller. I was born in Berlin in 1922. Both of my parents were born in Berlin. All four of my grandparents lived their entire adult lives in Berlin. My father served in the German army during World War I in 1914. I have a picture here of my father. That's it right there in this dress uniform. I'll have more to say about that a little bit later on. One of my grandfathers established a factory making shirts in Berlin in 1871. What I'm telling you here is that our family was anchored in Berlin. We were Germans, patriotic Germans. Uh, my grandparents lived in a small house just barely outside Berlin. My father had two brothers. One of them lived in that house, and one day he didn't come home. People went looking for him, and they found him, beaten to a bloody pulp. That was the time to beat up on Jews. And who did that? Kids 14, 15, 16 years old. How do we know that? They bragged about it for days afterwards, knowing very well that nothing would be done to them at all. The grandfather who uh, established that factory in 1871, along with a partner, they had a 50th anniversary celebration in 1921. My grandfather, along with his partner, they retired on that day. And my father, with, along with his other brother, took over the direction of that factory. That other brother was my favorite uncle. He was murdered in Auschwitz. 20 years later. Hitler came to power on January 1930, 1933. He became chancellor, which is the same thing as prime minister. He lost no time letting the Jews of Germany know which way the wind was going to blow. He established, he started the first boycott of Jewish-owned shops and they would post a brown-shirted stormtrooper in front of all these stores with signs, uh, with signs that said, Germans, don't buy from Jews. Another month later, the first concentration camp was established in Dachau, which is a small town just outside of Munich. By the time the Germans were done, there were well over 10,000 such camps distributed throughout Europe. And in addition to those concentration camps, there were six camps that were not called concentration camps. They were called extermination camps. That is precisely what they were. People by the tens, by the hundreds of thousands, were killed in those camps immediately upon arrival. Auschwitz was one of them. All six were located in Poland. Auschwitz also fulfilled other functions. There were, there were 41 or 42 subcamps. It was like a small city. But its main business was killing people. At the height of its capacity, that was in the fall, in the early fall of 1944, between 10 and 12,000 people were, were killed in Auschwitz alone every 24 hours. That became the fate of the Hungarian Jews, who until that time had been left alone in Budapest, the, co the capital of Hungary. Now, I am Jewish. I was 10 years old when Hitler came to power in 1933. I was enrolled in public school at that time. Did things happen? Did things change in that school? You bet. The very first thing that happened was the greeting between the teacher and the class. There was no such thing as good morning class, good afternoon class, that didn't exist anymore. It became the rule, I don't know it was a law, uh, but it was the rule to be followed by all, that the, the greeting now consisted of a Heil Hitler, standing up and Heil Hitler. 
uh, and the uh, entire class standing at attention, 10 years old, would respond in exactly the same way. At the uh, end of the, uh, of the uh, class, exactly the same thing, the teacher and the class. Now, that didn't bother me at all. Uh, I participate in that, of course. If I had not, I would not have lasted the day. Other things, however, in that class became very, very unpleasant. Kids that I had been played with all along, 10 years old, doing silly stuff, just playing along. All of a sudden, now little by little, no longer seemed to know me. They would turn their back. They had listened to what they heard at home and what they heard, what they read in the papers or anywhere else. I was no longer to be played with. And when you are 10 years old, that hurt. Now, was I obliged? Was, was it necessary for me to remain in that class? No, it was not. There were other three or four Jewish kids in that class. One by one, they left. I did not. I stuck around for well over two years. Why did I do that? Well, I thought at the time that I had a couple of good reasons. One of them was, was this. I had two very good friends in that class, really good friends. Both of them had become members of the Hitler Youth, which is sort of the junior contingent of the stormtroopers. Both of them came to class many times in their, uh, in their Hitler uniforms. Uh, they had become the top. They had become the elite. I had become a piece of dirt. It never made any difference to them, never made any difference to me. We remain good friends. And uh, I appreciated that a whole lot. That was a major reason why I stuck it out. Another major reason was athletics. That school was very sports-minded. Athletics counted for a great deal. And I had been a member of a soccer team and a uh, running team, and I was quite good in both. And they both, both of those left me alone, and uh, I loved it. That was another major reason for me to stick around. There was a third reason, which is very difficult for me to explain. In fact, I, I, I would almost say that it is impossible for me to explain. And I'm not sure that it really existed at the time, but it was a reason. Uh, I was stubborn and I just didn't want to be chased away. Uh, by my very presence, I wanted to show something. I wanted to uh, sort of prove, if a, pr if a proof was even possible, that all the stuff that, that the kids were being fed, that was all a lot of garbage. Anyway, that was the reason that I stuck around. Not only was I stubborn, I was only a little bit adventure-minded. And I loved to be on the streets of Berlin. Well, that was not without risk. For a Jewish kid to be caught in the vicinity of the marching columns of stormtroopers, which seemed to be everywhere. Of course, they were not everywhere, but that's how I remember it. Much of the time, I could hear them coming because they were, uh, I could hear them marching and coming because they were singing. So much of the time they were singing. My memory has become very poor. There were some things that I don't think I can ever forget. And the ending of one of their songs is one of those that I don't think I will forget. I remember it word for word to this day. And it goes like this, in German, of course. Wenn's Judenblut vom Messer spritzt, dann geht's noch mal so gut. Meaning, when Jewish blood spurts from the knife, everything works twice as well. I can't begin how many times I heard that over and over and over. Two years later, in 1935, a new set of laws was enacted, was, was known as the Nuremberg Laws. As the core of that law, as far as our family was concerned, was all of a sudden, from one day to the next, we were no longer citizens of Germany. We had become stateless in our own country. That hit my father very hard. 
Here he had fought for Germany. He had been a frontline soldier fight, fighting on the Russian front at that time. Now he was no longer deemed, uh, deemed worthy to be a citizen of that country. At the beginning of the First World War, there were approximately 500,000 Jews living in Germany. That was less than 1% of the population. Of those 500,000, fully 20%, 100,000 Jewish Germans at that time fought for Germany, were serving in the German military. As of this morning, the uh, Google lists the number as 98,000. I called it 100,000. Uh, that woke up our family. Uh, here, uh, until that time, many Jews who were, had not yet left Germany, were, they lived a life of illusion, of make-believe. They thought that one day all of this would just simply fall apart. It would no longer be true. It was in a mirage. Well, this was a wake-up call. And then now they decided this was for real. And so they proceeded to make preparations to leave. Now, I get a question quite often when I do my talking, as why didn't you leave earlier? As if that is such an easy thing to do. You had lived someplace for generations, and now you're told, now you're, you're thinking about leaving, where are you gonna go? Do you know the language in the other country? Does the other country accept you? Uh, this is, the, the difficulties involved in this are not imaginable, really. And so uh, you, you cannot blame anybody for hesitating. And our family hesitated. Uh, now they decided uh, the time for hesitation has pretty much come to an end. Uh, another part of the, of the, of the so-called Nuremberg Laws, uh, Jewish attorneys were no longer allowed to function in court. Jewish physicians were no longer allowed to use the title doctor. So these were just nasty things. Uh, I arbitrarily have always divided the 12 years of the Holocaust, 1933 to 1945, into two segments. The first segments, 33, to November 9th, 1938, that specific day. And the second segment after that, until the end, in uh, early May of 1945. What was the difference between two, these two segments? The first segment was this. The, the focus by the Nazis in regard to the Jews was to eliminate Jews from public life, essentially. That meant any Jew in government at whatever level, national, provincial, uh, municipal, doesn't make any difference, out. Uh, any Jews in functioning and education, university professors or teachers of, again, at whatever level, out. In entertainment, in the arts, in music, in the theater, entertainers of whatever kind, out. They did not want Jews to be visible at all. But there were no, not yet any mass shootings, not yet any mass arrests. Individual shootings, sure, plenty of it, but not as a matter of uh, group, uh, uh, well, what, uh, what can I call it? Uh, it was not yet applied to groups as a whole. That came later on, and how? Uh, the second segment from 1938 on, that was very, very different. Conditions were now created of such cruelty, such degradation and humiliation that cannot be described, it cannot be imagined, and it cannot be believed. But sometimes it is time, uh, what is difficult to talk about must be talked about. What is difficult to confront must be confronted. So I will go into the second segment, uh, difficult as it is to talk about. 
By the time the Nazis were done, they had invaded and conquered or otherwise dominated 18, 18 European countries. And in most of them, not in all, but in most of them, they had literally killed millions of people. But no group, be they Russians or Poles or Yugoslavs or Greeks or Albanians, or anybody else was earmarked for total extinction. Only the Jews, each and every one of them in their entirety, right up to the very last day of the Nazi regime. But not only the Jews as individuals were to be eradicated, but also their entire culture, their tradition, their history, their religion. All of their accomplishments in every field of human endeavors was to be done away with. All memory of their stellar contribution to the arts and sciences was suppressed. Streets named in their honor were renamed. Their books were publicly burned. Their houses of worship were also equally burned to the ground or otherwise destroyed. And all, all of their possessions were either confiscated or thrown on the ash heap. And all they had left were their bare lives. Before very long, that was taken too. To me, the most overwhelming aspect of the six million Jews killed was the wanton destruction, the murder of one and a half million children under the age of 15. One and a half million children under the age of 15. Can anyone Imagine or guess what shining stars in medicine, gifted musicians, talented writers, committed artists, dedicated scientists were simply done away with, murdered, bulldozed into mass graves, most often nameless. The English language does not contain the vocabulary, even remotely descriptive, of the enormity that had been perpetrated on a scale so enormous, so gigantic as to preclude comprehension by anybody. Winston Churchill had called it the greatest, most horrible crime in the entire history of mankind. At a different occasion, he called it the crime without a name. Now, I was very lucky. I was able to leave Germany in 1937 during that first segment where, where things were very rough and miserable, but we were still, you might say, livable. I was very lucky. I was 14 at the time, I left for Switzerland. And I stayed in Switzerland, remained in Switzerland a year and a half. My brother was 16 at the time. He managed to get to England. Uh, he was, as I said, he was 16 at the time. He left alone also. My parents were not able to leave. They, made, they did manage to leave later on during that second segment when it was virtually an impossibility, but somehow they did get out. Why were they not able to leave? Well, this is a long story, but I'll make it very short. My, mom, my father knew somebody who, uh, uh, who the, uh, the Nazis were looking for, the SS. The SS, they were the, uh, the most fanatics of the, of the fanatics. They were the super fanatics. Uh, they controlled all police functions throughout Germany and later on throughout most of Europe. They controlled, were in charge of all the concentration camps, there were the Secret Service, anything that had to do with police function, that was the SS. If they were looking for this person, they knew that my father knew that person. They accused my father of either knowing where this man is hiding or of hiding him himself. That wasn't true at all. My father had no idea. But they gave my father a very, very hard time. To this day, as I speak right here, I am surprised that they did not incarcerate my father at the time. My father was simply lucky. 
I got away with it. My father had no idea where that man was. But uh, the SS ordered my parents to surrender their passports at that time. So that's why my parents were unable to leave. Later on, and I'll make this short also, uh, well, okay, I can't make it all that short. The day after Crystal Night, I didn't talk about Crystal Night, that's what I was looking for, okay. November 9th, 1938, Crystal Night occurred. What is that? On that night, the Nazis used a pretext to burn down several hundred synagogues throughout Germany and Austria. They incarcerated thousands upon thousands of Jewish men into the concentration camps. They smashed something like 30,000 Jewish-owned shops. There was so much glass on the pavement that this became known as the Night of Broken Glass or Crystal Night that had real consequences for my family. They would, on the next day, November 10th, they would take Jews wherever they could find them, take them to the street, force them to their knees, throw stuff down, tell them, here, clean it up, while they circled around them, mocking them, hitting them, spitting at them, and calling that having a good time. That happened to my wife's mother and to my wife's brother. They almost never talked about it afterwards. Well, my parents went into hiding. They picked up Jews wherever they could. And we had a lifelong, wonderful, wonderful friend, non-Jewish. My, uh, my parents called her and, and asked, could we come over? And she understood immediately, and my parents went over. But my parents felt very bad about jeopardizing the safety of that, of that lady if it had become known or even suspected that she was giving any kind of, uh, of aid or comfort to any Jewish people, she might have had reason to regret that for the entire rest of her life. So my mother decided she would, would go back home to, to the apartment. My father knew somebody in the Catholic hospital. He went to that somebody and said, I need surgery. And that somebody immediately understood and asked no questions. My father had surgery twice real surgery. Well, in those days, recuperation took, for any kind of surgery, took a minimum of two weeks. So two surgeries equaled four weeks. During that time, my mother had a job to try to find a country that would accept them without a passport. Foolish undertaking, as my mother discovered right away. There was no, no way to do that at all. She, wouldn't, she didn't even manage to get inside to, see, to talk to somebody. Now a miracle occurred. My mother discovered, somebody told my mother about a lady in the Belgian consulate who for a lot of money, money meant nothing anymore anyway, she was able to secure passports, to secure the passports plus visum, ballot for Belgium for 72 hours for two people. But my father never went back to the apartment. He went straight to the train station from the hospital where he met my mother. My mother had the job during, during the last few days to try to determine what they allowed to take along. What they were allowed to take along was, was a little bit of old clothing, nothing else. Plus 10 marks each, but that was the equivalent of 2 dollars 50 cents. That's how they left. And finally, they arrived in Belgium with five bucks in their pocket. But you see, they were free, and they were healthy. They knew both of their boys, my, my brother in England, I myself in Switzerland, we were free and they were healthy. We had everything that mattered. What else did we want at that time? I'll tell you exactly what else we wanted, nothing. We had everything that was of any real consequence of our freedom. Now here, everybody lives in freedom. So we don't think about it. We take it for granted. We accept it. We don't, we don't talk about it. It's just there. Now, if that freedom ever goes, that becomes a different story. It's just like health. If you have it, you just have it. You don't think about it. If you don't have it, then 
<laughs> it matters. Then it matters a great deal. So freedom is the same way. Well, okay. So we lived, uh, immediately went to Belgium uh, to be with my parents. Then we lived in Belgium for about a month. We managed to get to Holland for, for a few days and then England. In England, we lived for a, day, for a year and a half as enemy aliens. That was our official designation. And the London police told us very quickly, if war breaks out in Europe, which it did, you will be uh, transferred and, uh, and um, interned on the Isle of Man, which is a little island in the middle of the Irish Sea. That's where the enemy aliens are going to be interned for the rest of the, of the war. Nobody knew how long that would last. So the war started in September, on September 1, 1939. Here in the United States, of course, started with Pearl Harbor, December 7, 1941, two years later. But in England, it started in 1939. London police came, your time is up, get your things ready. They gave us a few days, I don't remember how many days, and then you're going to go to the Isle of Man. Well, my father immediately went to the American uh, uh, consulate where he had been the number of times before to check on our quota number. And uh, he insisted on talking to somebody else uh, at the time. He got to that somebody else and that man said, yeah, let's look, let's look, let's look. What do you say your name is? Miller, Miller, Alfred Miller. Okay, here it is. Permission to come to the United States came through today. The same day that the London police told us we were going to be interned. That's not a miracle? You, but, but you better believe it was. Okay, so we came to New York. Okay, I arrived in New York 1943. By that time I was 17 years old. By that time I had lived in five countries. None of them wanted me. None of them welcomed me. And one of them I would have been killed in Germany. I wouldn't have believed that if somebody had told me. Uh, but it would have happened if I'd stuck around for another two or three years. Then in Switzerland, uh, well, they accepted me reluctantly. They didn't really welcome me at all. Uh, there's, uh, there's stories about that. Then in Belgium and in Holland, they told us right away, if you're still here 30 days from now, we'll uh, expel you back to Germany. Nobody need to tell us what that meant. And then England, oh, I told you, enemy aliens. Okay, so finally we arrive in New York, 1940. 1943, I joined the American Army. Uh, I was not yet a citizen, but I was in the Army, 1943. I'm not sure that there was any person more proud to be in the United States Army at that time as little private Al Miller at that time. Okay, I expected to, uh, to have basic training in the infantry, but that did not happen. They gave me basic training in the medics. I paid no attention at the time. Okay, they needed people in the medics, all right, fine. I was in the medics and uh, I learned a lot. I learned uh, uh, a great deal, a very much advanced first aid of all kinds. Then the army, in its infinite wisdom, decided to send me to college. Why? I have no idea. There was a program at the time, was called ASTP, Army Specialized Training Program. They sent me to college in Oklahoma A&M College in Abilene, Oklahoma. To do what? Chemical engineering. Nothing could have been further from my mind. I didn't care much about chemistry and engineering was something strange to me. Why would they pick me for that? To this day, I have no idea. But, I learned, again, I learned a lot. It was a very intensive training in whatever chemical engineering was. From very early in the morning until very late in the afternoon, very strict training. And that helped me a lot later on. 
when I got out of the army in 1946, three years later, I had a lot of college credits from, from this occasion. And I went to Ohio State and presented this and said, will you give me credit for college credit for this? And they looked it over, asked a few questions. They gave me one year worth of college credit. That was tremendous because that I used that later on uh, when, I, when I actually did go to college. After the chemical engineering business, uh, they, they sent me into the infantry, finally. And I discovered just a few months ago as to the reason for that sequence. Now I'll get to that. So now I was in the infantry, basic training all over again. It, it had been the rule, maybe a law, but certainly a rule for non-citizens not to be trained with weapons. That's why I was in the medics. But now I was in the infantry and I was trained with, with, uh, with uh, weapons. With the carbine, I was very good with the carbine. I got a medal for the doing things with the carbine, but I was not a good weapon at all. Uh, it didn't go very far, it was very light, it was much too late. The, the standard issue uh, weapon was the M1. And I did that, but only average. This was a heavy weapon and everybody had the M1. But uh, I did not exceptionally well with it. I did well enough, just about average. And I, was, and I did very well with the 45 pistol and I did very well with that and I was trained with that also. Okay. Now, I was in the infantry. Then eventually, I'll, uh, I'll get, I'm going ahead a little bit, I was sent to Camp Ritchie. What's Camp Ritchie? Camp Ritchie was a semi-secret military installation in Maryland, close to Hagerstown. So what was this Camp Ritchie? Thousands upon thousands of Jewish kids who had left Europe, left Germany, like myself, were eventually sent to Camp Ritchie. And when they got there, more often than not, they were greeted by people who looked like Germans. They had German uniforms on, and they were greeted in German. What is this? What is this camp? Well, people who looked like German, had German uniforms, were not German at all. They were the American GIs dressed up like Germans. Everybody sent to camp German spoke at least one foreign language, mostly German, but also sometimes several other languages. When I got there, I was perfect in German, still am, and I was very good in French at the time. I'm still reasonably good in French. I haven't used French in a long time, so it tends to leave you. But at that time, I was 100% perfect in German, let's say 95% in French at the time. So Camp Ritchie was a training ground to teach those kids, those Jewish kids, interrogation methods. That was the purpose of Camp Ritchie. Interrogation uh, of German prisoners of war. They were sent back, those kids were sent back on D-Day, June 7th, June 6th or June 7th, 1940. Uh, 1940. Sent back to Normandy. Sometimes they were sent ahead to in the, behind enemy lines to do all they can to pick up German prisoners to question them as to the disposition of the German forces and uh, the uh, whatever they could get out of the German POWs. And the interrogation methods were various. There were not just one or two methods. There were several different methods. We were taught all of them. Uh, it was a fantastic place. Uh, nothing like it anywhere in the American army at that time. Perhaps not in any army. Uh, we were taught, for instance, as a, during the process of how to interrogate, 
we were taught was very uh, it was very difficult. We were uh, almost hit by other people, by the by Germans in their German uniforms, uh, who did not wish to disclose their information, and then uh, we were told uh, no mercy, but. We discovered that the best method at all was to be friendly. You do not hit them. You do not uh, get nasty with them. Sometimes that worked. Sometimes that was necessary. Most of the time, we were told, be friendly with them and uh, manage to become not exactly their friends, but uh, uh, be nice to them. So, the Jewish refugees were suitable for these tasks because they knew the German language and importantly the German mentality and behavior better than most American-born soldiers. The role of these soldiers was therefore to work in the front lines or even behind them at strategic corps and army levels, at interrogation, analyzing German forces and plans, and also as members of the United States Counterintelligence Corps, and also to study and demoralize the enemy. Well, I suppose I have to regard this as good luck. They sent me to Camp Ritchie 30 days after the war was over. So what was I doing in Camp Ritchie now? There were no POWs to interrogate any longer. The war was over. Well, yes, the war was over. POWs, that was done with. However, there were hundreds of thousands of other Germans to be interrogated. Let me explain. During the war, 300,000 American GIs were killed. 670,000 were wounded. And we wanted to know who was responsible, who did all this. The day before the war was over, everybody was a Nazi in Germany. I, uh, yes. The day after the war was over, nobody was a Nazi. Me? No. And I never wanted this. There was a guy over there. I knew him, yeah, but he's no longer there. I don't know where he is. Nobody was a Nazi anymore at all. But the American occupation authorities, first under Eisenhower, later under other generals, saw it as their duty to meet out some sort of justice to the German population and to separate the sheep from the wolves. So the way that was done was to automatically arrest those who might have been responsible. Uh, if you were a truck driver in Germany during the war, you had to belong to the Nazi Trucking Association. If you were a school teacher, by law, you had to belong to the Nazi teachers' organization. If you were whatever you were, there was an organization for this, and you had to belong to it. It was not just a question of belonging and paying some kind of a uh, few dollars membership. You had to attend meetings. During those meetings, you were indoctrinated with the Nazi doctrine, with anti-Semitism, with everything else. So everybody uh, became officially a Nazi, so to speak. Uh, but the way to find out who was really into this 
was the first to automatically arrest all those that were hundreds of thousands who held an elevated position in these many Nazi organizations which had proliferated. As, as I already said, for instance, all public school teachers had to belong to a Nazi teacher institute. All factory workers had to belong and to join a kind of union which was thoroughly Nazi dominated and led. All civil servants, civil servants, literally throughout the entire German workforce, um, it was assumed that anyone who had advanced to a higher level in any of these various uh, groupings had to have been uh, had to have been and perhaps still was a convinced and indoctrinated uh, Nazi, uh, indoctrinated Nazi, in order to have merited these promotions. If you were a private, so the equivalent of a private, okay, we were left them alone. If you had become a corporal, well, maybe. If you had become the equivalent of a sergeant, you were automatically arrested and put into some camps where it became my job and the job of many others to interrogate these people, to determine were they responsible in some fashion, should they be retained and put under arrest for further interrogation later on, or should they be released. So it became my job to interrogate these people. The, and, and each interrogation uh, required approximately 15 to 20 minutes. Well, can you establish the relative guilt, the relative in, innocence of people who denied everything in 15 to 20 minutes? was not easy. Was I ever fooled? Absolutely, yes. I, could, I cannot claim that I ever hit it right on the spot. But most of the time, I do believe that I did hit the spot. And Cambridge, the instruction that we received, Cambridge had been responsible for that. We didn't know what they were doing. Very few interrogations took longer than 15 to 30 minutes. But each one required a report to higher headquarters with a reasoned conclusion for my decision or recommendation. That is where I learned to judge a man's character. I learned that it takes pretty much a pretty smooth actor to hide his true character even during such a short session. Many of them tried, but it was possible to acquire an almost sixth sense to detect, almost to smell, so to speak, when the individual put on a false front. Most of the time, not always, the reason is fairly simple. The American actor and playwright Sam Shepard put it this way, character is an essential tendency. It can be covered up, it can be messed with, it can be screwed around with, but, but it can, cannot ultimately be changed. It is the structure of our bones, the blood that through, runs through our veins. Character is who you are. Okay. Well, that's Cambridge. I'm coming pretty much to the end of what I wanted to get across here. Let me tell you at least briefly, but I sometimes, and I don't do this always, but I tell the kids in those schools where I give my talks. I talk to kids sometimes 12 years old. Uh, that's quite young to be talking about these subjects because they do not really have much preparation they couldn't possibly have read very much about it. Sometimes I'm surprised at the very excellent questions that I do get from them. So it's not impossible to talk to them. But I like to leave them with something that they can hang on to. We do live in a screwed up world anymore. If you don't believe it, look at your newspaper. Any newspaper, any day whatsoever, it makes no difference. I'm a sort of a bug on history, and it's been said that there's nothing new under the sun, and uh, to an extent I believe that. There's no such thing in history that stands alone as an isolated happening. Whatever happens 
has a connection with something that happened before. So I will I'll tell them this. If you want to change the world, make it a little bit better. better. You cannot change the world, no. But you can change it a little bit at a time. Everybody can do a little bit. There's nobody too young. There's nobody too old. Everybody can do just a little bit. And if everybody does just a little bit, it's no longer just a little bit. It becomes a whole lot, collectively. So I tell them this. Don't do to others what you don't want done to yourself. That sounds so simple. It is not quite so simple, but it sounds simple. And basically, yes, it is. Don't do to others what you don't want done to yourself. And I give them a couple of examples. Do you want to be bullied by others? It's not pleasant. If somebody is bullied consistently and mercilessly, that becomes a very, very sad issue. The people who are the kids who are bullied, they sometimes they end up killing themselves, literally. You read about that. So don't do to others what you don't want done to yourself. If you don't want to be bullied, don't do it to others. If you don't want something taken away that belongs to you, that's understandable. Well, don't do it to others. So I keep harping on that. And that's many times how I leave them. And that's, I guess, how I leave you right now. Okay? Thank you very much.